Welcome to Country Fried Rock, where we talk with musicians to find out what inspires their creativity. Country Fried Rock, music uncovered. Thanks for tuning in to Country Fried Rock. I'm your host, Sloane Spencer. This week, we're talking with Mike Fleming of The Steel Drivers. What happens when a band has its founding member leave, and then the lead vocalist moves on to other projects as well? Well, if you're The Steel Drivers, you grab a guy from Muscle Shoals, Gary Nichols. Put him in as lead vocalist, revamp your lineup, and oh yeah, have Adele say you're her favorite band. Not quite bluegrass. The Steel Drivers' new album, Hammer Down, on Country Fried Rock. My guest today on Country Fried Rock is Mike Fleming of Steel Drivers. Welcome. Hey, nice to be here with you. Thank you. I've gotten to see y'all in a few different places over the last few years. Where? I originally saw you at two different music festivals, and then I saw you at the Station Inn. Home. That's our home. That's for sure. What a great place. Uh Uh-huh. Very down-to-earth for mica tables, uh, (laughs) wood floors, popcorn, pizza, and beer. (laughs) Green room outdoors. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Even some Americana music floats in and out of there, kind of acoustic uh, with a little bit of electric. And, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful venue. You know, there's not a bad seat in the house. You brought up something that frequently comes up throughout the show. It's how you define who you are and what you are. And you're not exactly a bluegrass band. Well, we aren't in the typical sense. I think really of having maybe the most obvious thing is the lead vocal is instead of being the high lonesome sound of a Bill Monroe. It is a gravelly blues singer, more like Travis Tripp. And uh, that wasn't anything that we uh, did on purpose. That just when the band started with the original five people, Mm -hmm. Chris Stapleton, that's the way he sang. And uh, nobody thought any different about it. And the odd thing is a lot of people would go, Chris Stapleton, the baritone singer, wasn't a baritone singer. If If you go back and try to sing his part, they're as high as any tenor. He just not hitting a falsetto. I've taken to using the term upbeat string band music. Bluegrass is confusing to people who aren't into the bluegrass scene. They have preconceptions such as the high lonesome vocal and that sort of thing. The drums and the question of whether they should be there or not. Isn't it interesting that Dole Lawson brought mm-hmm. drums into his live performance? You know, it would have been frowned upon by, I would have thought, you know, artists of his era. But there they are. But, you know, I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band did it for years. That actually, you know, one of the things I heard was like, boy, isn't that a neat sound? And drew me a little bit into that music. How did you get started playing, personally? Well, like any kid, I saw the, well, I'll date myself. I saw the Beatles live on Ed Sullivan. Ooh. Ooh. And it was like, I want to do that. Yeah. (laughs) So... So I got a guitar, but it was goosey guitar. Ended up, seems like, learning more Bob Dylan, Peter, Paul, and Mary type song of the era until I could get an electric one. But uh, <laughs> that's, you know, the main influences when I first started. I didn't grow up in a rural area. I mm-hmm. grew up in small towns, some in Indiana, and then finally uh, ended up in St. Charles, Missouri, which at the time was a town of about, I think, 15,000 people. And that's where I finally you know, decided I'm going to play in front of somebody, too. I've never played by myself. Hey, y'all, this is Mike Fleming and the Steel Drivers, and you're listening to Country Fried Rock. So uh, how did that develop into something where you're like, this is what I'm going to spend my life doing? You know, it's ironic. Back then, I wanted, that was in my mind, this is what I want to do. But I don't know, at the time, I just I went from there to high school and then ended up in college. University of Missouri, still playing music through that time period, still more like Simon and Garfunkel, you know, the music of the time. And then uh, saw Bonnie and Clyde and Deliverance, and then heard <laughs> yeah. the first Nitty Gritty Dirt Band record. And it's like, I'm going to get a banjo. A good friend of mine got a mandolin, and we started playing music together up there in Columbia, Missouri. And it, when we graduated, we moved into a house. <laughs> Another guy that was a bass player, and it was kind of set. This is what I'm going to try to do, work odd jobs and try to do it. So that gets me into the you know mid-70s. <laughs> <laughs> At some point, it became more than a hobby. It did about that time, 75. Tried to really, tried to go out and play. 
four or five guys in a station wagon with a U-Haul trailer, trying to make a living, playing in a band, John Fogarty song, traveling right. band. Did that, and actually you could play regionally, maybe even get out to Colorado and play ski areas and stuff. Just beat you up a lot, but never made the move to Nashville. A lot of bands, you know, you go, oh man, what do we do? And it's kind of like, you got to get where the music's made and where it's, uh, you know, played for keeps. So kind of disbanded then in 1980. And that took me probably to uh, my wife and I, actually, who played, moved to uh, Eureka Springs, worked on a uh, country music show, the kind that they've got in Branson, Missouri. Did that for about seven years until the friend that I had played with in uh, Columbia, Missouri, had moved to Nashville, and it was, and that's Mike Henderson, oh. who comes into this a little later on because he's the man who brought all the steel drivers together. He said, you need to come to Nashville. And he was right. Nashville has musically has really, really expanded, especially since then. You could tell there was stuff going on. Like one of my first persons I played with, I started playing electric bass a long way, was with Kevin Welt, a great singer-songwriter. So what was happening was there was this singer-songwriter thing going on. Steve Earle with Mm -hmm. the old Canes. And you had this good kind of a blend of acoustic electric it wasn't hardcore country but it it sure sounded good and the songs were well written and so that was kind of what was going on when i first came to town we'd love to share with you our free compilation album the country fried rock collection volume one all the songs were donated for the benefit of nucci space a nonprofit organization helping prevent musician suicide in athens georgia please consider a donation to nucci space 100 percent of the money you donate goes directly to their services enjoy y'all i know that the lineup of the steel drivers has morphed over the years how did y'all then get together originally well back to mike henderson who I knew in college and played music with. He wanted to maybe play some bluegrass music. He'd Mm -hmm. been playing electric slide for years. He and Chris Stapleton had written a great number of songs, and none of them, they were being turned down by country radio. So he thought, well, maybe we can maybe work some of these songs up, play some bluegrass music down the station in once in a while, make some extra money. So he's the common thread. When I actually got to his house, and saw who all was there, <laughs> I knew Richard right. Bailey for right. a number of years. I knew of Tammy, but I never had met Chris. Gotcha. And each person was connected to um, another one or two people, but not everybody except for Mike. He was common thread. As y'all got together to kind of rework some of their songs, what led to, I don't know if a record came first or the band came first? Well, we played a couple of covers. It sounded okay, and then either Chris or Mike said, Oh, you think this song might work? And, <laughs> and it was something like Dark Whiskey. We played it. Tammy took the high part. I took the low, the baritone part. That's the hard part, by the way. No, that's what, <laughs> we have an ongoing thing with, with each other, Tammy and I, about who sings the hardest part. Great fiddle player. So it was like, boy, that was nice. Let's try another one. And I guess for about four Sundays in a row, we worked on just their tunes. We never went, looked back the tunes that were covers. And it was like, well, this is good. Well, can we get together a, enough tunes to put together a set? We did, and we started looking for a place to play, not in Nashville, where we could kind of just, you know, study our lesson a little bit and rehearse. And we found a VFW post in Franklin, Tennessee, who was kind enough to let us come out. They had a little PA system. And you couldn't get in unless you remember, right. or else we invited people. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a way for us to sharpen our tack. Now, we did that for, I don't know, three, four months at least, until we decided, well, let's, let's go in town and see, uh, see what people think. That was kind of how that worked. It worked well. People liked it. Other musicians started showing up, people that you, uh, you know, admire and uh, were giving us a a big thumbs up and led us to think, well, maybe we can move. Should we try to move to the next thing and make a record? So that led to the IBMAs, I think, 2006. The IBMAs, they had these showcase rooms all over the place. I can't even remember how we booked, booked some, but we did 
two or three. You know, you just play 20 minutes or something, you move to another one. But Ken Irwin saw us there. And Mike had had dealings uh, with Ken and Tammy also. We're with a band called the Dead Reckoners. So Ken was no uh, stranger, but Ken liked the music. He wanted to record it. Never miss a radio show from Country Fried Rock. Subscribe to our podcast on iTunes. Just search Country Fried Rock. It's Mike Fleming with Steel Drivers. I've described IBMA to people, like the vibe of IBMA. It's kind of like bluegrass version of Folk Alliance with, mm-hmm. with the rooms and the, the very short sets. And... Yes, it is. It's an opportunity for bands that are trying to get their music out there in front of people. And you're hoping, you know, that uh, might create a buzz while you're there. You play as many as you possibly can, at least when you're first starting out, you do. So that maybe, you know, Rounder or Pine Castle or mm-hmm. Compass or somebody hears you. And if that's what your goal is, then, um, you know, you get a label that will help you along your way. I mean, I'd be amazed is much more than that. But that's one of the things that they do help. After that first record came out, things changed for you all a little bit. Oh, it did. Well, I was so surprised at <laughs> um, the amount of things that happened so quickly. You're traveling in a uh, our most usual mode of transportation, <laughs> the lovely 15-passenger van. Yeah, it just seemed like reviews were very good. The uh, Wall Street Journal did a great piece on us. We started to get nominations mm-hmm. from different arenas and Got on national TV, and it was a very whirlwind year, no <laughs> doubt about it. Just unbelievable. It just seemed that every turn, something good was happening. All of you all came from different places in terms of what you had been doing. How did that then come in to impact what was working for you all as a band? Well, musically, it helped a lot. Got to do musically first. Musically, you know, everybody was coming from different areas. I've, I'd been spending a lot of time in the singer-songwriter world and some country. Tammy had been her own artist, but had been out, was out with Reba McIntyre. Mm-hmm. Richard was playing with lots of people. Chris was a songwriting predominantly. Mike was playing a slide guitar, songwriting. And when we came together to do bluegrass, something that we had all done several years prior to that, except for Richard, probably, we brought some of that along with us. And that influenced, obviously, Chris is singing, the way he sings, and the bluesiness of the whole thing was a big part of what made the Steel Driver sound. It's also, you know, at times very sparse. And it's sparse because that's the way we want it. You know, fewer instruments playing. Mm -hmm. um, And some of the singer-songwriter aspects came into play, too, Mm -hmm. that we'd all played with, where you're asked to play with somebody But you really don't know the material a whole lot, so you have to listen to it go through once, and then you start to make your way into the song. Well, several of our songs start that way. Rainbows Never Die. Just the guitar, just the lead vocalist, and then instruments begin to sneak in. I think that is such a a great way to treat a song. It's not that we don't play songs, you know, where it's just full throttle, but you can only take so many full throttle songs in a row. Now... As far as personnel, having all these other things and ways of making money or income or family and stuff, that's a whole different aspect of it. And so I guess it was in late 2009, I mean, Chris was becoming a father. He very successful songwriter, but we're out a lot and he's missing maybe. But he decided he wanted to stay home, songwrite, be a family man, and, you know, ended up pursuing some a rock and roll band where maybe his heart was a little bit more than bluegrass. So that that happened somewhere at the end of 2009, uh, right before the release of Reckless, our second CD. As you all went on the road with that, what did you do for your lead vocal? Well, we looked at uh, two or three other vocalists, thinking we would probably never find a match or something like that. But it ended up, Mike Henderson's wife was, on the internet looking at the CMT, it's a website archives, one that we had played on. She heard Gary sing. She just went, I think this guy sounds good, you know, and um, we knew, you know, where he lived because Tammy's husband, Jeff, had played down in, in Muscle Shoals in some of the studios and knew Gary. So, bided him up. 
you know, asked him if he was interested. He said he was. We sent him first CD and uh, got him up there, you know, and everybody's sitting around. I'm thinking, boy, what pressure to kind of just, you know, come up and, <laughs> and sing. And uh, asked him, uh, well, what do you want to start with? And he goes, how about Blue Side of the Mountain? which I think is like the hardest song to sing. <laughs> and I was like, all right, here we go. Jump in. Man, he just, he just tore it up. We were fortunate. You know, yeah. Gary has the, he doesn't mimic. His, his singing is similar to Chris's. Mm-hmm. It has the bluesy texture. It's just the way he sings. You know, that's right. what he grew up singing. And there's a gentleman named uh, Jeffrey Hines. He writes for the Washington Post. He'd heard both Chris, and then when he heard Gary, he said, Stapleton's a soul shouter, Gary Nichols is a soul singer, and the Steel Drivers sound is secure. Hey, y'all, Mike Fleming, Steel Drivers, come see us, steeldrivers.net, and on our Facebook page. I wondered where the Muscle Shoals to Music Row connection was. Well, pretty much Tammy's husband, who is a session guy and also plays with Reba, had gone down there and done sessions. But now we've got quite a connection. And there's actually a show called Muscle Shows to Music Row. That's a live music show down there, which is really a good show and taped and archived. Y'all have got that lined up. We do. Looking forward to it because we went there oh, it was quite a while ago. Right now, and I'll make another jump, I guess, and that is this configuration of the band. Brent Truitt and with Gary and with a new record, new songs, and the the time that we've spent with the older songs is so strong uh, performing. The musicality uh, factor has gone up. With, um, Brent Truitt is a, a world-class mandolin, and Gary is a, a, g- a very good guitar player. He had predominantly was an electric player, but he is now doing stuff on acoustic that has enhanced the older songs and uh, play some leads also now, cool. and not just leads like, you know, strictly flat-picking leads. So the older songs have expanded a little bit, and then with the newer songs, it's just a lot of fun to play on stage. Well, that's a great explanation of how you keep existing material fresh while continuing to create new material as well. Thank you. Well, you know, who's the master of it, I've, I've thought, is Mark Knopfler. I don't know if you've ever gone to any of his shows, but... He's always got the few, you know, songs that everybody wants to hear, sure. uh, Money for Nothing and uh, stuff like that. And he lets it develop so much, and, in, and there's a, this kind of noodling going on and mm-hmm. stuff. And, and then finally gets into the body of the, the tune. We don't do all that because we don't have a big, you know, drum kit and an and organ pad. <laughs> but we can do a fair amount of, of uh, enhancing on a song, and... It brings new life to it with that kind of stuff. Hey, everybody, this is Mike Fleming with the Steel Drivers. Come take a listen to our new CD, Hammered Down, at steeldrivers.net. You can pick it up there, or we'll direct you to iTunes. So early on, you said that Mike Henderson was the glue or the thread that connected everybody, but then he ended up moving on to other things. Yes, he did, and that was in the fall of 2011, I think. We as a band wanted to pursue this to the extent of traveling a lot more than I think Mike did. He had traveled the world playing with, you know, by himself or with other artists as a sidesman. And I don't think he really wanted to pursue it that hard. Mm -hmm. He had plenty of, you know, work in town and projects and songwriting. So, yeah, he decided that he would going to bow out. And that was right as we were going to go in to record the next CD. Ah. And so that took us, that kind of took us for a loop for a little while because we all had to, you know, reassess what we were going to do. And uh, we were thankful that uh, Ken Irwin and our label rounder, Ken, I said, Ken, are you still, you know, up for doing the next CD? And he said, certainly I'm, I'm up for it. Great. So with that in mind, that's when Richard called Brent Truitt. And Brent had been a sub for us during some of two, summer of 2009 when Mike couldn't go to some of the gigs. Ah. So he already knew the material Great. on the first two CDs. Great. Plus, he knew Richard, 
Plus, he knew Tammy, and I had met him. You know, we had traveled with him. Mm -hmm. And it's so funny. (laughs) I remember, I'm going to divert here for a minute. When I first came to Nashville, I worked at a rehearsal facility, and I was a monitor guy, and I would (laughs) twist knobs, you know. People would come in to rehearse, and I'd sit there and listen to them talk, and it was was how I got my first job, actually. But uh, I remember people auditioning for a drummer, and they, the drummers, they had about five of them come in, and when they left, they all agreed, and this was the, uh, the band leader and the other people, uh, instrumental players, that a certain drummer was the best, but would he travel well on the bus? And they went with the second best drummer, who had a personality that was very likable. So, back to Brent, not that that would have kept him out, but we already knew that traveling with him is so easy, and, and he's fun. Always a positive man. And uh, so he said yes, that he wanted to do it, you know, so we could keep on point and get in the studio. And that's what we did. Uh, sometime, I can't remember when it was, maybe March of 2012, I think. Oh, got it. It wasn't that long of a time frame then. No, we already had probably three quarters of the material. We try to learn new songs as we go try them in the show and see if the reaction's good and then keep playing them. So by the time you get to the studio, you know them. There was, a, I think, uh, maybe two or three on this one that we hadn't played before. And what's different about songs that y'all have road tested versus ones that are fresh when you're in the studio? They get better after <laughs> we play them. <laughs> good answer, good answer. I mean, it's honest, you know. I mean, you can, I think we, we had a good... You know, a good uh, hit on uh, Tammy Rhodes' song called Hell on Wheels. And uh, I think it sounds good on the record, but uh, after playing it now for a few months, I think we burn it. I mean, I think <laughs> our performances of it is really good. It's not a huge difference, but you can tell the difference. What's happening for the songs as y'all have been out on the road now? I'm trying to think if we've really changed much in the... We're staying fairly true to them right mm-hmm. now, I think. Yeah. We're not uh, expanding them too much. What's kind of nice is we're starting to see our fan base embrace the songs. And, you know, we've always got people that will sing Drink and Dark Whiskey right. and sing If It Hadn't Been for Love. But, you know, we've been, we're starting to go to some places and, and people are, are singing Shallow Grave or they're singing I'll Be There. And that's kind of a nice validation because the first two CDs were very powerful CDs, I think. Yeah. But this one seems to have good momentum mm-hmm. being received well, both on the Americana and the Bluegrass uh, Billboard chart. The critics have been kind, and uh, <laughs> so <laughs> so we feel good about, about this CD. Country Fried Rock is a proud sponsor of Front Porch Fest, coming to Stewart, Virginia, August 30th through September 1st. Get your tickets now at frontporchfest.com. Are you seeing some changes in your fan base from the first two records to this most recent one? So it's hard to say. We've always seemed to have had a pretty uh, diverse fan base. And if the Station Inn can be an indicator, people 20 years old up to 70 plus years old. And I think it depends on the venue where sometimes you see the diversity in Knoxville, Tennessee which is just a a wonderful location for us to play. And I bet it was, you know, heavier on the 30, 40s with 20-year-olds in there, too. But it's great. It's great to have people. It's just not, we're not disliked by a certain age group, it appears. I think it's interesting because not every band has that diverse of an age spectrum. And I think a lot of it is the songs being with that kind of bluesiness, the, for lack of a a better word, the muscle we play them with sometimes, sure. intensity, appeals to the younger kids. Uh, a song like Midnight Train to Memphis is sounds like a blues song, mm-hmm. you know, with a soul singer. But, you know, it can go into just a soft song like Sticks It Made Thunder, too. But we're really pleased with the number of younger folks that seem to be coming. In fact, and now what's happening, I'm having... I can't quite remember where we were. I had at least two or three adults come up to me and say, my kids turned me on to you. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it was. That's I was like, really? 
Well, that's great. That's so, super cool. <laughs> yeah, it is cool. It was really cool. So uh, what do you all have on tap through the summer? Well, we're out there in that festival world. It's action-packed from Colorado to Washington to upstate New York, Washington to, of course, right in Tennessee and North Carolina. Yeah, just trying to, to spread the new uh, deal driver gospel out there a little bit, and hopefully people like it. And they and so far they appear to really appreciate getting the chance to chat with you, Mike. This oh, has been fun no, for no. me. It's a pleasure. I'm always amazed people want to hear about our music. So <laughs> it's you know, the highest compliment a musician can have. That's for sure. <laughs> well, it's great stuff. Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care. <laughs> Take care. Safe travels. Bye bye. Country Fried Rock music uncovered. Find our full playlist at countryfriedrock.org. You can subscribe to our weekly podcast on iTunes. Just search Country Fried Rock. Our theme music is from The Heap. Check them out at heapdeluxe.com. That's H-E-A-P-D-E-L-U-X-E. Our Country Fried Rock stinger is from Steve Soto and the Twisted Hearts. Country Fried Rock. Copyright 2013 by Lilypad Productions. All rights reserved. Country Fried Rock is a partnership with the nonprofit Florence Regional Arts Alliance. Your donations to this program are tax deductible to the extent you are eligible under U.S. law. Country Fried Rock radio programs are distributed to public radio through the public radio exchange, prx.org. Ever he been helping us some country fried?